This is St Andrews, South Brisbane. What is your understanding of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? How often do you reflect on its true significance in your daily life? Do you see it as a transformative act that affects your actions and your attitudes? Are you willing to live sacrificially? In The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis depicts someone who ends up in hell, although the person who happens to be a bishop refuses to admit that's where he is. In hell, he leads a theological society. Some might say the two go naturally together. Here, the ghostly bishop describes what a paper he is to present is about. I'm going to point out how people always forget that Jesus, here the ghost bowed, was a comparatively young man when he died. He would have outgrown some of his earlier views, you know, if he'd lived, as he might have done with a little more tact and patience. What a different Christianity we might have had if only the founder had reached his full stature. I shall end up by pointing out how this deepens the significance of the crucifixion. One feels for the first time what a disaster it was, what a tragic waste, so much promise cut short. Just to allay any fears, that is a load of twaddle, although I'm afraid it isn't so far off what passes as theology in some quarters. Just as C.S. Lewis's fictional bishop misunderstood Jesus' mission, we too can sometimes miss the full depth of his sacrifice. Let's open our hearts to fully grasp the weight and purpose of Jesus' journey to the cross. In our studies in John's Gospel account, we were last there in February, we've reached chapter 18, and I'd like you to please turn there with me. It's on page 1084 in the Church Bibles. C.S. Lewis's fictional bishop's view contrasts sharply with what we learn from John's Gospel about Jesus' intentional and sacrificial journey. Verse 1. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. In chapters 13 to 17, we've had the Last Supper, followed by what I've heard referred to as Jesus' after-dinner speech. But now, the action moves on. Jesus and the disciples leave the upper room and the city of Jerusalem. The Kidron Valley lies immediately outside the walls of the city. It's a deep gorge between the city and the Mount of Olives, which is where the garden is located. Matthew and Mark name it as Gethsemane, which means oil press. Luke recorded in chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. A more literal translation is, set his face to go to Jerusalem. As the NIV Study Bible says regarding Luke chapter 13, Jesus' eyes were constantly set on the holy city and his ultimate destiny. Another significant stage in Jesus' journey had been his entry into Jerusalem at the beginning of what we know as Holy Week. Now it's the Thursday night of that week, Maundy Thursday, and Jesus is setting out on the penultimate stage of his journey to the cross. Tomorrow, 
will be Good Friday. In his first letter, chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, Peter writes, It was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Jesus' sacrificial role was foreknown before the creation of the world. In Matthew 6:21, we read of Jesus' prediction of his death. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This is also recorded in Mark 8 and Luke 9. These passages show that Jesus knew his death was necessary for the salvation of humanity. If you think that basically I'm okay and you're okay and all that needs to happen is a bit of tinkering to smooth off rough edges and make things better in that way, then I can see why you might think Jesus' death was pointless and even, in the view I quoted at the start, a tragic waste. Yet that was clearly not Jesus' view, and given that the ghostly bishop conceded that Christ was Christianity's founder, you might think that Jesus' view counts for something. It is not without significance that Jesus' death occurred at the time of the Jewish Passover festival. The historian Josephus tells us that during a three-hour period, 256,000 lambs were sacrificed in the Jerusalem temple. This hark back to the original Passover, when the Israelites were set to leave Egypt. Then, the lamb's blood shed stood in place of the Israelites' firstborn, who were passed over by the angel of death. Think about that huge number of animals sacrificed in the temple during a short period. Have you considered the practicalities? The blood of the animals was drained as part of the sacrifice and poured at the base of the altar. What then happened to so much blood? The answer is, there was a blood channel and it led out into the Kidron Valley and into the stream that ran through it. As Jesus crossed the valley that night, its stream was running red with sacrificial blood. Jesus' crossing of the Kidron Valley with its blood-stained stream symbolized Jesus as the ultimate sacrificial lamb, crossing into his final act of redemption. We also face our own valleys, times of trial and sacrifice. How can we draw strength from Jesus' example to face our challenges with faith and courage? Have you fully grasped the magnitude of Jesus' sacrifice for your sins? We need to think about how we can live lives that honour the redemption Jesus provides. In verse 4 of our passage, we read, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus' death was not a tragic waste. It was not pointless. It was a deliberate act by Jesus with a purpose, to pay for the sin of mankind. Your sin, my sin. Jesus knew what he was doing and why he was doing it. As he crossed the stream, flowing with the blood of sacrifices, he knew that the next day his own blood would flow for our redemption. How does knowing that Jesus willingly faced this ultimate sacrifice change the way we live? Let's ask ourselves how we can honour his sacrifice in our daily choices and actions. 
but as a crimson tide from the Saviour's side, and it purgeth all who plunge therein. O oh, its healing stream doth the soul redeem, and it cleanseth from all sin. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. Jesus' knowledge and acceptance of his calling teach us about obedience and purpose. Are you willing to follow God's will, even if it involves sacrifice or suffering? I invite you to reflect on areas where you may need to submit more fully to God's plan. When faced with uncertainty or fear, do you trust that God has a purpose for you as he did for Jesus? Let's commit to trusting in God's greater plan for our lives. Three times when confronted with the soldiers, officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, Jesus quite deliberately says, verses 5, 6 and 8, I am he. In chapter 8, Jesus told the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him. They did so because they understood what Jesus was saying by identifying himself with the divine name Yahweh, I am, as he does here in Gethsemane. Jesus is saying, I am God, come to you in person. We don't know what lay behind Judas's betrayal of Jesus, but we do know that he was thinking in earthly terms. He couldn't grasp the willingness and necessity of God's own Son to die on our behalf. It is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be, that God's own Son should come from heaven and die to save a child like me. And yet I know that it is true. He chose a poor and humble lot and wept and toiled and mourned and died for love of those who loved him not. Simon Peter was another who struggled to understand what was going on. Verses 10 and 11. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? It's reminiscent of Peter's reaction back in Matthew 16, when Jesus had told the disciples of the necessity of his death. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. We are, of course, eternally grateful but Peter didn't have the last word on this matter, as was Peter in due course. Judas betrayed Jesus, and Peter misunderstood Jesus' mission. How do we respond when others betray or misunderstand us? Let's seek to forgive and show compassion, following Jesus' example of grace, even in difficult circumstances. The scene ends with a reminder of what Caiaphas had previously said. Verse 14. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Yes, it was good. That is why the day of Jesus' death is called Good Friday. He breaks the power of cancelled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood availed for me. But Caiaphas didn't grasp that when he said what he did. He was yet another, destined only to think in earthbound terms. Good Friday is called good because of what Jesus' death accomplished. Do we live in a way that reflects our gratitude for his sacrifice? Let's commit to
to living lives that are thankful, obedient, and filled with the love of Christ. Jesus' death was not a tragic waste, but a purposeful act of redemption. Take time each day to meditate on the significance of Jesus' sacrifice for you. How does it impact your decisions, your relationships, and your view of yourself and others? To what extent are you willing to put yourself out? Draw strength from Jesus' example. Trust in God's plan for you and remain faithful even in challenging times. Ask God for the courage to walk through your difficulties with faith, knowing that he is with you. Jesus knew his destiny and embraced it with intentionality and obedience. Are you living intentionally for God's purposes, or are you merely drifting through life? I invite you to evaluate your life and identify areas where you can live more intentionally for God. Set specific goals to align your actions with God's will. Consider how you can serve others, share the gospel, and grow in your relationship with Christ. Like Judas and Peter, people may betray or misunderstand us. Jesus responded with grace and compassion. How do you handle betrayal or misunderstanding? Pray for strength to forgive and show compassion following Jesus' example. Seek reconciliation where possible and let go of grudges that hinder your spiritual growth. Good Friday is called good because of what Jesus' death accomplished. Live in a way that reflects gratitude for his sacrifice and express this gratitude through acts of service, worship, and obedience. Let the reality of Jesus' redemption transform your daily life and interactions with others. Let's commit to living in the light of Jesus' sacrifice. Let's not just acknowledge it intellectually, but let it permeate every aspect of your life. Reflect daily on the cross. Draw strength from Jesus' example. Live intentionally for God. Respond to challenges with grace and walk in gratitude. May the power of Jesus' sacrifice break the chains of sin in your life, set you free, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let his redeeming love be your theme until the day you meet him face to face. Go forth in the knowledge that Jesus' blood availed for you and live a life that honours him. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your incredible sacrifice. Help us to understand its significance deeply and to let it transform our lives. Give us the strength to face our challenges with faith, to live intentionally for your purposes, to forgive and show compassion and to walk in gratitude every day. May your redeeming love be our constant theme. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Oh.
Jesus.